So we're going to take a brief look at these reaction rates and equilibrium con concepts. First off, as you see here, the rate of a chemical reaction measures how fast, how quickly we take reactants and change them into products. Some reactions go very, very fast, some not as fast, and we can measure this experimentally. It's the collision theory, though, that is pretty much dictating why some reactions are faster than others. And in general, the collision theory just says that atoms, ions, or molecules must collide in order to react. And if we look at a little visual of that, here we see two reactants, A and B. If they collide properly, they form this activated complex, a short-lived, temporary, unstable arrangement of atoms where old bonds are breaking and new bonds are forming. Well, once this activated complex forms, there's a 50-50 chance that it's either going to go back to being reactants or it's going to go ahead and become our products. And that's going to depend on a couple things. First of all, we have to have proper orientation as well as enough energy. So if we have an incorrect orientation, then the molecules are going to collide and just bounce apart. Okay, so any type of incorrect orientation. If we have the correct orientation, then it'll collide, form our activated complex, and go ahead and form the products. If there's enough energy. If there's not enough energy, again, they're just going to bounce apart. That quote-unquote enough energy is what we call the activation energy and that is the minimum amount that's required to get a chemical reaction to go and this activation energy is abbreviated EA and typically the A is dropped down like a subscript and so that's our activation energy so if we look at a reaction diagram and we'll look at two of them here. You can see that you've got reactants on the left and products on the right. So again, reactants, just like when we're writing a, a reactant in class, reactants are on the left, products are on the right. And so we can see that in order for the reactants to become products, we have to overcome that activation energy. At the peak of the activation energy is the activated complex. If there's enough energy, whoosh, then the products will form. Not enough, boom, they'll bounce back and be, stay reactants. Now here we see a reaction in where the products have less energy than the reactants. And so there is energy released by the reaction. Since there is energy released by the reaction, that is what we call an exothermic reaction energy is released to the surroundings. Here we see uh, another diagram. Again, still, reactants on the left, products on the right. We need to overcome the activation energy. And this time you see it's a much bigger hill, but still the activated complex is at the top. And again, if there's enough energy, products will form. Not enough, back to being reactants. But here we see that the reactants have a lot less energy than the products. So there's energy absorbed by the reaction. And when we have that situation, it's what we call an endothermic reaction, where the energy is absorbed from the surroundings by the reaction. So again, just a little brief sum up. Your collision theory that these reactant atoms, ions, molecules, they must collide, they must do so in the correct orientation and with enough energy in order to become products. If the products have less energy, then that is an exothermic reaction because energy was released. If the products have more energy, then that's an endothermic reaction. So there are five main factors that affect the rate of a chemical reaction. Reactivity, some things are just very reactive by nature, our alkali metals, our halogens, for example. Concentration, temperature, surface area, and catalysts. So we'll take a brief look at these different um, factors. 
Again, reactivity, some things are just more reactive by nature, how they are put together. Concentration, here you see a little visual I did with cars, but obviously if there are more particles, there's going to be more collisions, and more of them are going to be in the proper orientation and with enough energy. So here you see there's a much greater chance of having a major accident at rush hour than there is when you're on the open road. Not to say that when you're on the open road where there's not as many cars around you, collisions can't happen, but the likelihood of collisions happening is much greater when we have higher concentration of reactants. Surface area. Okay, we talked about this when we were dissolving sugar from a packet versus a sugar cube. If we smash down our reactants into the smallest particles possible, that means there's a much higher amount of surface area in which these collisions can occur. Thermite, if you've ever heard of thermite, that is powdered aluminum and powdered iron 3 oxide. And when you have these powdered solids, you can get quite an explosive reaction. Here's a little snippet from a Mythbusters showing just how explosive a thermite reaction can be. So the Mythbusters, what they did is they took an old car and they loaded thermite on top. They lit it up and slowly but surely this reaction starts going. And then after a short amount of time, boy that reaction takes off. You can see all the smoke, the intense flames. It starts you know, melting the metal, dripping through the frame of the car, blowing out the windows, all because the, both of those reactants came in a powdered form. If they were just solids, in solid chunks, you would not get this explosive of a reaction. And so if you'd like to see more of that, again, I just um, YouTubed Mythbusters Thermite, and you can see that very explosive reaction in more detail. Temperature. Typically, when you increase the temperature of a reaction, we de uh, generally increase the rate of reaction. So when you are cooking, for example, you increase the temperature to get things to cook faster. And to prevent spoiling and food going bad, we cool it down in the refrigerator or in the freezer. And so again, we're increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. So the faster those particles are moving, the more likely they're going to have that proper activation energy and complete the reaction. So it says here that increased temperature does not cause more collisions, but it increases the number of collisions that have enough kinetic energy to react, which again is our activation energy that's necessary to get over that reaction hump. Catalysts you've probably heard of. Catalysts speed up reactions without actually being used in the reaction themselves. And so catalysts in our body, we talked about earlier in the year, they're called enzymes. Inhibitors stop catalysts from being functional. So they actually slow down reactions. But how a catalyst essentially works, if a reaction needs this much energy, in order to go to products, a catalyst lowers the activation energy and makes it a lot easier for those reactants to become a product. And um, one of the catalysts in our body is lactose. Uh, I'm sorry, lactase. Lactose is milk sugar, and some people can be lactose intolerant. And so if they don't have the lactose, haze in their body, that enzyme, it won't be able to break apart the lactose. And so they'll have digestive issues. So they can take a supplement or whatnot. But that's one example of an enzyme at work in your body. Brief joke. So someone's driving down the side of the road, they see someone who needs help, and they are missing their feet. And they get out of the car to help this person and they walk over see the missing feet and punch him in his face and the guy says why'd you do that for and the other guy said sorry I'm lactose intolerant get it lactose <laughs> all right just seeing if you're still awake in the food industry we have inhibitors and they're called preservatives because we want things to last longer also, those the a new buzzword, antioxidants. 
those are another example of inhibitors in the food industry and catalysts again you saw in the book that you have a catalytic converter in your car that uses platinum and rhodium in an effort to speed up the conversion of bad gases into not so bad gases as they are distributed into the atmosphere from your car so the last little thing here that I'll mention is the fact that you know chemists say that if a reaction goes almost completely to products we say that it goes to completion however most reactions do not go to completion they end up hitting this point where it's reversible because it can go both forward and backward and once you have a reversible reaction then you end up reaching what's called chemical equilibrium and this is what we'll be looking at in class but essentially when this happens and we've talked about dynamic equilibriums this year but we have the forward reaction and the reverse reaction happening at the same rate that does not mean we have the same amount of reactants and products it's not smack dab in the middle 50 50 it just means all of a sudden we get to the point where forward and reverse are happening at the same rate and the concentration of products and reactants are the same doesn't mean equal but the same and we'll investigate that as well as Le Chatelier's principle in some of our laboratory activities this week. Hope this helps. Good luck on the quiz.